Hey, welcome back to Create Out Loud with Jen Loudon. I am so excited to give you this week's episode with Lorian McKenna and Meg LaFove. They're both screenwriters. They have a fantastic podcast, The Screenwriting Life. This episode has really stuck with me. There's a couple of gems in here that I just haven't been able to to let go of, which is exactly what I want for this show, right? I wanted to change how we create. So certainly changing how I create. So Lauren McKenna has written for studios, streamers, and indie films, including Hulu, NBC, and Disney. And she's a former story manager at Pixar and dig the movies she has worked on. Up, Brave, Inside Out, and The Good Dinosaur. Amazing. And Meg is a Oscar-nominated writer and Peabody Award-winning producer. She was nominated for co-writing Pixar's Inside Out. Isn't that an amazing movie? Oh, my gosh. And she also wrote the script for The Good Dinosaur, which was nominated for a Golden Globe and got a story by credit on live-action Captain Marvel and, you know, just all kinds of great stuff these women are up to. I cannot wait to share this conversation with you. It has so many gems that have just rearranged the way that I think. So without further ado, let's hear how Meg and Lorian create out loud. Meg, I am so curious. How did you start with egg pictures and Jodie Foster? Like what, how was that the beginning of your career? Yeah, that's my past life. I've had many lives. Uh, Well, it wasn't the beginning of my, of course, you know, as, as my manager says, you know, people who come out of nowhere and, and, there's never really true, right? We, we've been working our way up. It's just, everybody starts to notice at some point. Um, I started, I, my grad school was working at ICM uh, as an assistant and kind of learning the business. And I worked I, at CAA. Right. So, you know, it's a bit of learn by fire. Mm-hmm. Um, and then from there, I became an assistant slash creative executive with Jody's company and worked, it was there for 10 years and worked my way up to running her company. Um, and she really became my story and film mentor, which was the best part of the whole gig. Um, yeah, mentoring is such an important part of, of having a creative career. And I know it's something you both do that I want to talk about for a second. But Lorian, you tell me a little bit about your early career. Uh, well, after I graduated from college, you know, I was uh, 20s. I don't think my brain had fully formed. So I was lost and confused. I had no idea what I was doing. Eventually, I found my way to grad school, you know, like I think eight years after I graduated from undergrad and I got my MFA in playwriting. Uh, the program that I was in lasted two years. <laughs> so I am, you know, one of two classes to graduate from that program. And I'm very proud of that. Um, And I worked in San Francisco, you know, I had a day job, but I also, you know, started a theater company and I worked with other playwrights to put women's uh, scripts, you know, our work up because there wasn't really a place for that. And then I, you know, acted and I taught and then I found my way to Pixar, which was such a great second master's degree in structure and how films are put together you know i didn't really understand that so it was a really great place to learn that and meet meg and both of you have made the leap from other roles like you've just spoke about in the film business to really being screenwriters and can you talk a little bit meg about what that leap was like because so many people want to make the leap to calling themselves a writer in whatever genre or a creative in whatever field and they it, they, it doesn't feel it's okay. They can't give themselves permission to do it. Right. I mean, there's certainly the one side, which is the economic permission to do it, which is a separate thing that mm-hmm. we're talking about. But if you, if you have that opportunity, um, for me, it was a series of leaps. Um, you know, it's not like in the movies where it's like the climax oh. of the movie and oh, <laughs> you did it and now you're done. It's a series of leaps. So the first leap was realizing that I was complaining a lot about not doing it. And my husband kind of putting my feet to the fire and saying, either do it or you can never complain about it again. And I kind of took him up on that. And I went to Jody and we were in a process of renewing our deal. And I said, I, I'm not going to come with you. If you renew the deal, I'm going to quit and be what I want in my heart as a writer, because I don't want to be 80 and wonder what I could have created as a writer, what I could have, what stories I could have told. I don't, I don't want to have that burden. I was already, you know, close to, uh, I was like 38, 39. So I felt like I needed to jump now, or I was going to get lost in the business and keep going. And there's this moment where you're like, am I going to 
if I take this job, if I take this next step, there's going to really be no going back. That's how I felt. She was very, very, very supportive. Um, but now it's a series of leaps of actually doing it because, you know, I immediately had babies because that's the best way to avoid writing. <laughs> <laughs> you have to feed a baby. The baby's crying. I can't write. Like it's the perfect excuse. Because, it's you know, even better than remodeling your kitchen. <laughs> oh, no, it's a baby. Who would, who would who would ever give you crap for taking care of a baby instead of writing? Nobody. Um, but, you know, it's meaning it's the first big thing is, OK, now I'm going to do it. Now you actually have to do it with no feedback. There's no feedback coming back. There's no recognition. There is no you know, I created a support group around me of women to to say, keep going and to read my stuff and to be my champions. I think it's really, really important in that phase of it. And then there comes the moment where I get a phone call and this is so long ago that it was, um, you know, a machine and on the machine <laughs> is JJ Abrams himself. JJ Abrams is on my phone machine saying, I'm going to, I want somebody to run my film company and I'm going to interview five people and I want you to be one of them. And I had to call up JJ Abrams and say, no, it was almost like the universe. Once you jump, I think the universe then tempts you to go back to say, how serious are you? Are you really going to do this? And I wrote a three page response before I called him back. And my friend Felicity said, Meg, who was part of my group, I think all the universe wants you to say to JJ Abrams is I'm a writer now. You oh, have God. to declare it. You have to say it out loud so without terrifying. anybody giving you permission to JJ Abrams, by the way. Like, oh my God. And I did. And it was, and I was dead silence after I said it. And I was like, oh my God. And he said, congratulations. I can't, I want to meet the writer. Come in and I'll meet you as a writer. So we've just heard a lot about saying no to really great things. And that brings up for me the times I didn't say no. The times that I went, that's a good idea. I should do that. I think that is the giveaway, the dead, dead giveaway. I should, I should take that job. I should do that project. I should write another self-help book which was true for me. I should do this spinoff company that I did that I then hated. So we sometimes we really have to forgive ourselves for those shoulds, for those times we didn't say no. I think that's a lot more common than the courage that we just heard about. How do we forgive ourselves so we can move on now to that calling, to that, to that bigger life, to creating out loud? Does that ring a bell for you? Is there some work to do there about letting go of what you did say yes to so that you can now say no. I had to declare it. And I think there's this moment of having to declare it on our Facebook page for the screenwriting life. Our podcast, Lorian really was amazing and asked the writers on the Facebook page to declare it in the comments. And it was so fun to watch them all kind of do everything, but declare I'm a writer. So I think it's, it's an internal jump that has to keep happening. And just to end the story, I do want to say that when I got nominated for an Academy Award that morning, that support group who had started with me back when it was nothing and I had nothing and I was avoiding and they were my support group, they all came oh, to send me off and celebrate this journey that was years and years of a journey of, of little jumps and constantly jumping and constantly choosing myself and my, myself as a writer. Um, so that was kind of, it, it's a series of jumps. Support group, support group, support group. So who can you text? Who can you lean on? I feel like part of what I've done in my 30 years of being a creativity mentor in all different ways is, is help people create that support in different ways, whether it's relationships they make at my retreats with each other that have kept going for decades or relationships that happen and leaning on each other that happens at the Oasis, my membership community. How are you going to create that for yourself? You've got to believe that it's okay to have it that you're not weaker or less than, you've got to let it in. And sometimes you really have to go out there and look for it. Meg talks about that, right? She went out there and formed that support community and they were there for her when she got nominated for her Academy Award. That is amazing. That is amazing. But I bet even more amazing is all the times they were there for her when things were really, really hard. So where is that support group for you? Maybe you know exactly and you can see their faces and maybe you're like, I need that. How do I get it? You get it by starting to look for people in groups that you're in, in retreats that you go to, in classes that you take, in online. They're everywhere. Look for people you spark with and then reach out to them and propose some way, whether it's just texting each other on a bad day. Start small, but get support. Don't try to do it alone. 
Meg, that is a, just a fantastic story. There's so many things in my own experience in, in a different way that echo that. And I have to tell you that in my writing retreats, I have people declare I am a writer. Oh, fantastic. And, it, for, and I've done it for probably 20 years and it freaks people out. It does. It I really, know. and I'm like, you don't have to do it if you don't want, you can say I am writing if you don't want to, you know, but yeah, there's something about identity that's so important. Lorian, what about for you? Is there, I know one of the things you've talked about on your wonderful podcast is the concept of a shadow artist. Yeah. I mean, that, that's Meg's, right? Meg introduced mm -hmm. me to that concept. And uh, that's what I was doing for a very long time. And, but I don't think for me, it was negative or bad. It was how I was evolving, how I mm -hmm. was getting to the part where I could be a writer. I mean, and it was such small jumps, you know, way back when, you know, I was so focused on being a teacher. I was teaching classes at the college at my alma mater. I was teaching high school classes and junior high classes, like drama and English, like all the things I loved and was passionate about. And I worked so hard to get this one job, which was a full-time teaching job at a Catholic girls school to be teaching drama and English to run the drama department. I mean, it was a full-time huge job, like my dream. And they made me the offer. And I was temping at Pixar, you know, at the time, one day a week, making $10 an hour, you know, like rolling posters. I was in my mid thirties. So this was not like a, a huge career opportunity to be temping at Pixar in my thirties, working for the consumer, de consumer products department, you know, but I, I took me, I just felt in my gut, like deep down in that knowing place that I couldn't take that teaching job. And it was so hard to say no when it was the thing I'd worked so hard to get. And I decided to say no, and I did, and I rolled the dice and there was no opportunities for me at Pixar at the time. It was literally like, you're working for six weeks, Fridays only, $10 an hour, right? Like that was the gig. I think I was temping for an intern's vacation, right? Like literally <laughs> the lowest point I think anyone has ever entered Pixar. Like just pile it on there, right? right? You know? Not even the story department. No. One day a week, temping I mean, for an intern. <laughs> yes. I mean, she went on a six week break. So, I mean, it was, and I just felt in that place that you just know, like, I will be miserable if I go teach and I would have done it. And I would have, I would have done my best, but I said, no. And, uh, it, you know, it worked out. <laughs> um, but it was really scary to make that leap. And before that I'd made a big leap before that too. I'd quit my full-time office job in San Francisco to teach at, at St. Mary's, my alma mater, you know, I just kept moving incrementally toward it. And when I left Pixar, I took a job at Paramount Animation as a development producer. Like mm -hmm. that was as close as I could get, right? Going from story. And most of my work at Pixar was writing adjacent, right? I was supporting the writer. I was supporting the story team, supporting the creative process, which was fantastic. I learned so much and I got to be a part of these wonderful films and meet amazing people, but it wasn't me. And I started to get more and more riled up about storytelling and my version of these things and and uh I, and that sort of made me make this jump like i'm gonna go be a development producer that's that's the biggest thing i can move toward that's not quite admitting i'm a writer and then um and then you know when my contract was over after a year at paramount in la I, it wasn't renewed and i was just now i was in la i'd moved my whole family here and I didn't know what to do. It was terrifying, right? I had this, I bought a house in Silver Lake. Oh, right? you still live in Silver Lake? <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful. But I committed to this life of being an animation producer. And suddenly I realized I don't know what to do next. And very oddly, you know, Meg and I and another wonderful writer, Chris Whitaker, we, you know, pitched a TV show and managed to sell the pilot, which was my very first experience in TV. So I had this idea that like, oh, that's how that works. That's so easy, <laughs> which is the opposite of how it works in real life, which was a really great leap. And then a really good rug pulled out from under me. But yeah, it's the same kind of journey. I, I, one of the things I've told the story before, when I first started working with Meg, we had lunch together and you know, she's so curious and supportive of other people. She's like, tell me Nosy. who you are. 
<laughs> no, I like, yeah, it's who you are. And I said, well, you know, I used to be a writer and I felt like this, she was offended on behalf of like the writing goddess, right? Like, how dare you say you used to be a writer? You can't I just, love that. You, how- you can't walk away from it. You are a writer, whether you're, you know, it's like, it's a thing that you're called to do. And so that sort of shocked me into like, oh, wow, I actually have a responsibility to pursue this. Um, so looking back, it's so easy to see how I got where I am. Sure. It makes more sense in the rear view mirror yes. than when we're living it. But in it, it was like tumultuous and crying and uh, am I making the right choice and different opinions from like family and, and, you know, and to be fair, my husband and my family and my friends have all been very supportive of me. Um, but a lot of it was just coming from my inside terror. Am I good enough? Can I claim this? And even still, I've accepted that I am a writer, but the I am a screenwriter part is tricky because while I've sold things into development and while I've write, written scripts, I have yet to have my name on the screen that says written by. So it's hard for me to claim I am a screenwriter because I'm making a living sort of, you know, in the background, you know, but I haven't had that yet. So sure. yet. Yet, yeah. yet, 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 yet. Yeah. It reminds me of people who will say they're a writer to a friend or at a party or a, at a work situation. And someone will, uh, will say, well, what have you written? Mm-hmm. What have you published? Or in LA, what, what have you had produced? And how that can really kill someone's confidence. Mm-hmm. And I always try to tell my, my people and my students and my clients, it, it doesn't live out there. It doesn't live out there in the, in the outcome because you can get the outcomes. And then they, yeah, as you said, it's a constant process and we're constantly having to do it again. Well- and even after you get it, the next question is, what have you done lately? Exactly. It doesn't ever, that never stops. It never stops. It <laughs> so never it can't stops. be the barometer by which you measure because it, no. it's, it's, it's random. So that brings me to one of the things that when I listen to your podcast, you all talk about a lot of different projects that you're working on. You know, whether they're different things in development or different things you're doing, you know, on the side or, or to, to recharge your creativity. How do you have that many projects going at one time and, and track them and, and feel like you're getting some traction on them. Meg, you want to start with that one? Well, I mean, uh, I think I come from producing. So my brain is used to having a lot of pots boiling and I actually get nervous if I don't have that because, um, so like how many projects at one time? Well, be uh, Paid projects, really, you're being paid to, do, to give usually exclusive to that project, but you're going to have on the side your own mini pots that you're boiling for yourself, i.e. on the weekends or you're doing at night or whatever, um, that you're, you're, you're keeping things on the boil and moving forward, even as their main day job is this big project, because... One of it's just a practical thing because it takes six months to a year to get paid for any project. Even when you're ready to go out and pitch it, it's a long runway. So just to make a living, you have to have things boiling. But also creatively, I I like to be able to step away from a project and go towards something else. It help, some brains don't work this way, by the way. Some really can only do one at a time. Whereas my brain wants to go chew on something else that's in a different stage. Maybe it's only in the blue sky stage and it somehow refreshes my creativity then to, and get away from that project and now go back into that project. And I will also say the truth is sometimes just the sheer, like, do it. Like, I don't feel inspired. I don't know, have any ideas. Everything I thinking, thinking of, I think is crap, but guess what? You got to do it because it's due or you said you were going to do it, or you made a commitment to somebody, be it a friend, be whatever that on Saturday, you're handing it to them. And I do find some really good stuff comes out of that push, just comes out of that grit of do it, do it, do it. And so I like to have a lot of projects to get me into that grit space. How many hours a day do you write? Oh, all day. I mean, and then there's writing, which is literally imagining and writing things. And then there's talking to people about it because you're getting notes or you're spitballing what it could be. Um, so, but it's a full, it's a eight hour a day job. I mean, your brain in terms of actually writing, I think after six hours, I start to peter out, but then I might be going to, um, a meeting or, or so the creativity is always churning. And Mm -hmm. I work a lot of weekends too. I have to be honest. Um, 
I work a lot of weekends. That's an incredible output. How about you, Lauren? Um, How do you handle all those projects? How do you keep, you know, like, it's really, you feel like you're cheating on some of them. (laughs) (laughs) I wish I had a philosophy about how to approach it, but it feels like it depends on what they are and what else I have going on. Um, I think that if I'm being paid for something that has to take first priority um, and then figuring out what else I can be working on my, my like sweet safe spot is just working on one thing. I just want to focus on one thing, one script, and that's, I want to put all my energy into it. And so I have to really shift, you know, I can't just sit here and wait to get feedback on the script I delivered last week. I have to be working on something else. So I have to figure out a way to sort of shut my brain off from that project and let it be over there with someone else. Now I find that a real challenge. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I, I, I don't know. I mean, Meg, Meg is always so good at sort of putting it all, framing it into like a, a strategy or a philosophy, like a craft. And I'm very much like, I don't know, what am I doing today? <laughs> today, after I get off this, I have a phone call that I have with my friend that we meet every Thursday and we share weeks back and forth. We do his work, then my work. Um, and, you know, if we miss a call, we charge each other $25. I have to say, because we're both so freaked out about money, we have not missed a call. And I think a year and a half since we set this up. I love that. <laughs> um <laughs> you know, and then this afternoon I'm going to be working on a new idea. You know, I'm Mm -hmm. just going to keep asking myself, what am I angry about? What am I angry about today? Because that's how I find (laughs) my ideas because I'm realizing I just have so much anger. I have to get it out in a healthy way, which is writing about it. I love that. What am I angry about to find your next idea? That's unique. (laughs) I think, I think a a lot of people frame that in a healthier way, which is what I'm, what am I curious about? Uh What do I care about? And I'm like, what am I pissed off about? (laughs) Um, and because I have a lot of anger in my body and myself, especially right now, right. In these yes. years. Oh my God. Yes. So, so I, I wish I had one of those like smart, here's yeah, how I no. answers, but as usual, I just sort of winging it flying by the seat of my pants, yeah. scared, you know, like, what do I have to do today? You know? Yeah. We've, we've talked about money or, or touched on money a little bit. And one of the things that, so I started, I went to film school. I started off trying to be a screenwriter and I, I really, I didn't have the balls to do the business. And, and I will say to my sweet self, you know, you were in your mid twenties and, you know, and I didn't right. have a mentor and I didn't, I tried to get some mentoring. So, you know, I look back at that and say, oh, you could have done it, honey. But I, I veered towards books and and then for a number of years, it was pick me, Oprah, pick me. Okay. Oprah, pick me. Okay. Bestselling list, pick me, you know, all, and some of those things happen great, but a lot of times they don't happen. And I got really worn down after about 12 or 15 years of doing that, of wanting to be chosen. And then I've tried to design my business as much as you can to choose myself and generate my own clients and, and income, but you are both in a business where you have to be picked. You can't make a TV series by yourself. You can't make a feature film by yourself. I mean, you can, but you know, not at the level that, uh, especially animation that you both have worked on and working in. So how do you manage that me- mentally and emotionally? And, and then we can talk about money more specifically, but how do you take care of yourselves when you, when you don't get picked? And how do you take care of yourselves when you do get picked? <laughs> yeah, I know getting picked, there's a whole other thing that rolls up yeah. to you do. I mean, even when you get picked and even when they're going to make it, it's not yours anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, a, it's super collaborative. It becomes the director's movie if it's a feature film. If it's an animated film, it becomes, it's that director's movie. Um, so there's the process of writing in which you're generating blue sky ideas that are very much about you, but the form itself means it's going to go away from you and become its own thing, like a child. Like, mm-hmm. it, yeah, you created it, but it's its own thing and it's going to get a director and a production designer and actors and all kinds of stuff are going to come in and it's going to become its own. And you and part of the process of writing is allowing that to happen, right? So the there is the pick me for sure. And we all have that, um, but the, for me, it's always picking the writing. It's always picking the storytelling. And I guess I just feel like um, that um, it's a sacred um, duty to write. Um, you've been chosen by the universe to tell the stories. And if you don't tell them, they'll never be told. And those characters who want to come out into the world are never going to exist. 
And it like a kid, once they exist and you love them and they start changing because the director wants this or whatever, you know, that can be painful, just like your kid, right? <laughs> um, but that is the process and that is the artistry of it. So for me, it's really always trying to go back to myself and what I love. I find going in to pitch a story, let's say, if the, if the basis of what I'm pitching is my excitement about it and how much I love it. You can say, I don't love it, or you can say it doesn't fit with whatever widget. Cause you know, getting picked by the way has so very little to do with the actual thing you're bringing. It has mm-hmm. to do with who's the boss and what are they looking for? And what do they need to blah, 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 what blah, did blah, they blah, eat right? lunch? I mean, it's so, <laughs> has so little to do with you or with even the quality of what you're bringing. So that it's, to me, it's always about, I love it. And that's why I stay and hang in and do many, many revisions because people aren't getting it yet. Why aren't they getting it? What skill do I need so that, because I love this and I want it to be in the world. I mean, I, I have, a, I've optioned a book series that I think my agents are like, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> the, like as a widget, as a thing to sell, it's very hard, but I'm like, if I don't sell it, I don't sell it because I love it. And I just need to write this pilot. I don't know why. I don't have any idea why I have to write this pilot, but I do. And the thing that got me all my work, the sample, it got me my, it even got me the Captain Marvel job, Mm -hmm. is a TV spec pilot about a guy who keeps a girl in a box under his bed. (laughs) Every fantastic, by the way, it is fantastic. (laughs) Every rep I have has said, if you had told me you were going to write that, I would have told you no. But I was obsessed and so curious about these women who get kidnapped as young girls and then never leave. Like even when the doors are open, they don't go because now the prison is inside their mind. And how are we all doing that? How are we all locked in our own ideas of the world and ourselves? And so I felt a lot of passion going in and pitching that. So guess what I'm saying is if I'm always... The choice is my story. The choice is my passion. And if you don't like it, I love it. And by the way, this can happen even if it gets made because you're going to get reviewed and some critics right. are not going to like, gonna it. like it. And you're going to get notes and people are going to go, I don't get it. And it's like, I know, but I do. And I love it. So, you know, you have to love it on its own for itself because you cannot even if you got on Oprah's list, that doesn't mean you're not going to get reviewers who don't like it, right? Like right, there's no there, guarantee. There's, there's no, no perfect. There's no. It's always. It is part of the artist. Artist. The, the 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 process that we're in. So for me, that's where I try to sit. You know, I'm not saying I do it well all the time. There's days I text. <laughs> I text rant, Lorian. Like, you would need your support system to remind yeah. you. Hey, it's about the work. Just go back to the work. I love the passion in what Meg just said. Pick the storytelling. And and I feel a little embarrassed, honestly, because I was like, pick me, pick me. And I can just see how in the past, my ego and my own lack of self-worth got in the way of my creative endeavors and bravery and success, maybe, because I wanted someone to say, you're good enough. And I, I really feel like something different in my body and, and to think, no, pick the storytelling, pick the calling, be devoted to that. That I just feel like kind of a big, <laughs> a big iceberg of my ego just went, okay, bye-bye. <laughs> bye-bye now. Let's focus over here. Ah, this is huge for me. Do you have, do you have a reaction like that? Or maybe you're like, oh yeah, no, all along I've been picking the work, in which case, yay for you. <laughs> I, I think that. that's really the thing that uh, I have to keep reminding myself of is uh, you have to separate yourself from the work, which is uh, hard because mm-hmm. it's so personal and so powerful and it comes from you. And so that's, that's what I try to focus on when I don't get picked. And when I do get picked, right? Because <laughs> how hard do you fight to keep it? the you, the thing that you put into it mm-hmm. when the it's other passion, voices start yeah, yeah. to say, well, here's this note and here's this note. Let's I'm turn her into a boy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the answer is no. Um, I'm working on a project right now, which is a new experience where I'm uh, supervising. I'm collaborating with a writer. She came up with the idea of the TV show and then I'm executive producing it. So I'm sort of creatively shepherding it and helping her through the development process. And if it goes to series, you know, I'll be show running the project, but it's this balance of this is her project. So connecting to what she loves about it and then giving her notes that 
are connected to that, being able to see that and not putting myself on top of it, but because mm-hmm. I connect personally to the project, which is why I decided to be involved, uh, where that line is, right? This is still her project, but trying to help her shape it in a way that tells the story more clearly. Uh, so it's a really, it's an interesting process for me. I'm learning. I'm developing i'm growing which is exhausting i know (laughs) it's always like what is it with writing do we have to constantly evolve ourselves and i'm like yes it's art art is always evolving if you're not growing and changing your writing dies Yes, it's if you're it, not growing and changing through the right. I writing. am in the wrong business, you guys. <laughs> no, I you're not. just no, you're want not. to rest. I'm so tired of evolving. <laughs> God, my, so my mom was, is painful. It is, it is. My mother was an art teacher. And so I grew up with a lot of art around my house and, you know, uh, lots of, you know, and I decided a couple of weeks ago that I was going to take a class, an art class, because Zoom, let's do it, right? <laughs> you don't even have to leave your house. And I, because I have this image in my head of an art piece I want to do. I don't even know. It's been percolating for years and years. Okay, let's try it. And I need to learn all these different things to put it all together. I need to learn how to put paint on material and I need to learn how to stitch. I, don't, I have this whole image in my head. But the, getting from the image in my head to where I am now is like the Grand Canyon. Like, like I'm taking this class with these women who clearly have, they're artists, they've been working a long time and I'm a beginner. And I'm, you know, the, the teacher's like, hold up your work. And I'm literally like, no way. <laughs> because they're, they're all holding their work up. And I'm like, oh my God, look how good. Look at the color choice. Look at the shape. I, mine is like a brown blob <laughs> because it's about being a beginner again, you know? And that I have to learn a whole level of skill set, and I actually need the time to start doing it at least once or twice a week to even think I'm going to get in the flow of it into the river of painting on material and adding thread to that. And, you know, I don't have that time to do that. So it's actually more painful because I have to bump against the wall every time I go back in of, oh, right, I don't know how to do this. And how do I do this stitch? And I, I really do think getting into the flow every day actually helps you move out of that beginner place, which is so crumbly. And I mean, I had a sculpture teacher once who, and I got mad and threw my things down and walked out and he came out and he was like, so you're feeling like you can't do this. And I'm like, well, no, I can't do it. And he was like, well, congratulations. You're a beginner. And my suggestion to you is enjoy the view because if you stick at it, you won't be here anymore. And I was like, okay, I guess I have to go back in. So I guess I'm just saying that part of this too is is letting that, yourself be a beginner you and letting be, yourself be, be in that really awkward gap. And, and if you keep pulling out because you don't like how it feels, it's yes. just going to stay hard yeah. for longer yeah. <laughs> versus sit in it and you will evolve through that into a next stage. But for me, even in this beginner grumbly stage, I'm, I'm still obsessed with this image I have of this thing I want to make. And I know it'll never actually look like what it's in my head, but it's holding, it's, it's keeping me it's like a flame, right? It's, I don't care if anybody likes this thing or it doesn't matter because I want to make it. So it's keeping that flame alive, even just a little bit every day. I have a Pinterest board now, but I'm collecting images to help me keep the flame alive. So it- I love how you, you, you're so clear. I mean, I wish everyone could see your face because it's, and I know everyone can hear the tone of your voice. The, the place that you keep bringing me back to is this is why I'm doing it. This is what's interesting to me. Right. And that keeps you going. Yeah. And um, I don't know why that is because I have, you know, the same complex as everybody else has of I'm not worthy and, and, you know, uh, all the insecurities of why me, why should I tell my story? Why should my story be anything anybody wants to hear? Why would anybody want to see this thing that I'm going to make that's in my head? They shouldn't, but I don't know. Maybe it's my age. Maybe it's doing this long enough. At some point, I just, I just have my dog with a bone, man. Like I just want to, and I can't, you cannot, you cannot worry about the other people's view of it. You worry about it or concerned about it just in terms of the feedback you're getting of the skill set you need to move forward and express more what you want to say. And that is the great art. Those are the great artists who the the work we love is them giving themselves over like that. And Mm -hmm. you don't have to necessarily think you're worth it or, that it's great because you don't, you just have to push and do it anyways. Mm-hmm. And keep coming back to that skill set. Yeah. 
Well, I love that so much, Meg. Thank you. Um, so let's talk a little bit about money and how do you manage the uncertainty of the money coming in? Um, you both have families and kids and Sorry, college I just tuitions. Have to laugh. And- I just have to laugh for a minute because it's so stressful. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's, I mean, I want an honest answer. I do not want the, I do not want the, uh, uh, airbrushed answer. Yeah. I mean, I've, so I've been a full-time writer, screenwriter. Here I go. Good. There she is. Hey, hey, hey. Good. Since I think 2015, 2016. And, um, I've had really amazing years and really not amazing years. There was one point where, you know, my husband is a huge avid comic book guy. He collects comic book stuff. And he had this amazing art collection of original comic book art. And he always said like, it's an investment for the future. And I had to come to him and say, it's now it's today. It's the future. The future, the future has, has arrived. Yeah. We had to sell our house in Silver Lake downsize use the money that we made. I mean, luckily, you know, I owned a house in the Bay area that I bought before I was in any creative endeavor when, you know, my husband and I both had like San Francisco corporate jobs, mm-hmm. you know, so I was able to buy a house in uh, the East Bay so that we could sell that to move to LA. So I had that, which feels very privileged because you know, yeah. I knew I had the, the house, mm-hmm. um, but we had to sell the house in Silver Lake downsize. We had to sell his art collection in order to live, right? Mm-hmm. I was still writing every day still hustling, working, doing all the things that a full-time writer does, but we were broke. Like, I mean, broke in as much as like we have a house, right? right like, right. Uh, but you know, but we I all have different have, levels of broke. And, and... Yeah. I didn't have any money coming in. Mm-hmm. And so we were living off, um, money that we made investing in other things, our home, the art collection, God, what a blow to my ego, right? I'd made this huge leap. I'm going to do it. I'm a writer. And then I am a f- failure mm-hmm. because I am not able to make money to support my family. And it, it's hard. And that pops its head up a lot, right? Like, when I'm waiting to see if this show goes to series or not, it, cause that determines the next two, three years of my life. And it will either be, I'm working on a series or I'm not. And mm-hmm. then what? So it's this sort of kind of, and you asked earlier, you know, how do you have lots of pots bubbling? And that's why, right. because, right. <laughs> because I, if this series goes, series goes, oh my God, I'm going to be so excited to work on it, right? Like I love the writer. I love the producers. I love the executives we're working with in the network and it's a great show and it needs to be made. And if it's not, okay, what, what else do I have that's in process that I'm already out there pitching that other people are already reading? And that's, that's why. And, but I got to say, it is one of the main reasons why I'm ready sometimes to be like, all right, I got to quit. I can't handle Mm -hmm. this anymore. Like Mm -hmm. I'm not young. I have a family. My husband doesn't work. I'm the sole income earner. So this is like it. I don't know what I'm going to do if this doesn't work out. So the option has to be, it has to work out. So I have to keep coming back every day and showing up. And some days it's, I had a really bad day on Monday about all of this. Like I just couldn't, I didn't do anything. I was just sort of in that place of like, I don't, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. Sometimes the stress just takes over your brain and and then that makes being creative really hard. Yeah. And you know what I should have done, right? When I beat myself up about it was come downstairs to my basement office and write to put it all in my writing. And I just didn't. And, you know, I, I, it's just really hard, you know, to, to manage that stuff. And I don't think I reached out to Meg so she could kick my ass. Cause I knew exactly what <laughs> you she did say. it. I'm like, oh my gosh, she didn't text me. She had a yeah. bad day Monday. She didn't text she, me. Because I knew that what she'd say is go downstairs and write, just write for 10 minutes. She'd say, pick mm-hmm. just write, And then all of a sudden I'd find myself creating something amazing and new because that's usually how it works. But I just didn't. I faffed around in my house all day and picked fights with my kid about third grade math. And so, I mean, it's really, really stressful. I think it's probably the number one reason why people don't stick with it. Yeah, you know, it blows people out. I think so too. I mean, I've been a self-employed creative writer, publisher person for 30 years. And when people ask me, well, how have you done it? I'm like, I had to do it. I had to make money. I, there wasn't anybody in the, in the wings. <laughs> there wasn't any, you know, man with a honeypot. <laughs> Wait, you know, I had to do it. And, and I think that, I mean, it, it's not comfortable and it was very stressful. 
uh, especially in the, those years when I was younger and my child was young. Um, and I still do side hustles, right? I still yeah. do consulting mm -hmm. for, you know, films for people. Like I still do that. I don't know that I'll ever feel comfortable giving that up, giving my connection to that up. Sure. Uh, well, I can't. I can imagine giving it up, but right now it's not a reality. Right. So and, it, and it's practical and it's smart. And, and that's what I hear. Meg, how about for you? What, what's it like to deal with the uncertainty? And um, I mean, certainly the side hustle, I had a, a, a good long time of, of it went after I quit my fancy job and into trying to be a writer. Um, I did a lot of side hustle in terms of the consultants and stuff to keep that going. I've been very fortunate in that my husband and I have been able to, um, take turns. Um, so, uh, you know, I went first and I got this job as an executive and he was able to write and become a painter and a filmmaker and, and find his stuff without having the pressure of earning money. And then when I, you know, quit now it's his turn, right. And now he has to get the job and he has to bring in the income so that I can take that time. And now it's flipping back again, because now I can, the writing can sustain us. Um, and he wants to go make a film and he should be, you know, he should do that now. So I've been very fortunate in that I've had a partner that we've been able to flip back Don't and forth. That's fantastic. Um, even in that, you know, there's been side hustles for both of us because, you know, it's art and you never know, it's not a consistent income. You know, there's moments that I'm literally like, oh my God, remember people get a check every week. No, I, every I, week I, they get a check. That. Like, it's not like you don't have to have this constant self-generation. Um, yeah, it's so, it gets so hard. Sometimes it just, you know, you know, if you don't do it day after day, it's, it's so self-motivated. It does. And, and I know that when my husband, we've been together 13 years and when we got together, he, he was kind of couldn't understand it at first. Like, why don't you take weekends off? Why don't exactly. you have vacations? And I'm like, vacation? <laughs> don't you understand? I'm, I'm mm. down to the water. Of this, I, my feet are moving. Um, <laughs> you might not see it underneath. I'm like a duck. It, but I'm like a duck and my feet are going. Meg, um, and I, Meg and I got to go on a research trip for a project we did together. Oh, and so that was... That was the vacation. Yeah, right. Yes, that was. <laughs> we stayed in a hotel. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Exactly. Room service. It was, it was amazing, but it was work. But still, like, oh, this is how writers take vacation. Work. Right. I mean, right. the thing that I hold on to um, is that my uh, worst day as a writer, all this stress we're talking about, not just the stress of finances, the stress of having to have multiple projects, the stress of putting yourself out there to evolve in mm -hmm. a marketplace, getting notes, all the stuff, right. Um, that day is still better than my, that day is still better than my very best day of producing. Wow. And that's uh, how I, I know, because yeah. I'm still, I'm sitting in myself. I'm sitting in what I feel is my authentic calling. So I have the energy to do all that stressful stuff. If I was being a producer and having to do all that stressful stuff, because by the way, there's stressful stuff over there too, mm -hmm. but I'm not, I'm also having the stress of not being in my calling. Just the stress of that was so much worse than the stress of how hard it is to be in your calling. If that makes sense. Like, Oh my no, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. I just, I just want to take, I mean, my, my whole heart just went boom, 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 boom. really like that is so, because we forget to notice that, right. We forget to notice that. So one of my favorite episodes of your podcast is when you talk about putting yourself out there. And one of the things that I see so many creative people do is hide. Whether they hide, they make the work and then no one ever sees it or they hide from themselves and don't even make the work. Um, so do you want to talk a little bit about each for you personally, what it's like to put yourself out there? Well, I, I actually don't struggle with that. Ah, um, yay. Look, yay. I am happy to give you whatever it is. I mean, certainly after I give you my work, I will freak out. But um, my, my uh, struggle is a little different is that I have been working through and I think I've, I may have, who knows, whatever, I'm, I'm in progress, I'm evolving, whatever, I make no claims, um, is that I am in the habit of like, here, I wrote it, first draft, barf draft, what do you think, right? Because I love feedback. I want, you know, I want eyes on it. You know, I always had trouble journaling because I'm imagining someone else is reading it. 
I don't know that place inside where I can be comfortable with myself, where mm -hmm. I feel safe with myself. I need validation. I need external eyes on me. I need to be performing. Mm -hmm. um, so I have no problem with, ta-da, here's this thing, but it's usually not ready. So I need to hold back. I am learning how to like work on it and work on it until it actually is finished ish until I can give it to somebody to get feedback that actually helps what I am doing instead of just validating me as a person. Again, oh, that's that. that is, that's fascinating. Tell me I did good. Yes. <laughs> Tell, Tell me, me I, did yeah, yeah. I wrote, I wrote yeah. validation, yeah. right? It's so yeah. hard for me too mm. to like write a draft and then write the next draft. And then no one sees this other draft because I'm like, no, no, no I did that. Did it exist? Did it exist? <laughs> and sometimes when I'm getting notes from people uh, that I trust, I'll be like, oh yeah, in this other draft, I had that. So I, I am uh, working on that. So um, I, you know, I, my, I don't understand, right? I get mm -hmm. it that people hide, but that's just not my process and right. not my personality. <laughs> You're going the other way. Yes. Um, but I think it's, it's not necessarily amazing mm -hmm. that I am fine coming on a podcast and talking to you, that I am fine sort of blathering on about all of my personal stuff because that actually is in its own way hiding. I see. Um, yeah. I control what other people see and hear about me so I can hide the deeper, scarier stuff. Yeah. Um, so I come across as someone who's so vulnerable. I hear that a lot. You're so vulnerable. You're so raw. And I'm like, I have tricked you um, <laughs> because this is this little show here. I mean, it's real. It's who I am, but it's how I hide. But hiding makes me feel safe, makes me feel like I am in control. Mm -hmm. And that's probably what people who are not willing to show their work or not willing to write, then you're in control, right? If you mm -hmm. never write, then you don't get feedback that you're not good enough. Right. But it's an illusion. It's an illusion. <laughs> it's all <laughs> fake. No, the control is an illusion that, that, mm -hmm. that, um, I mean, certainly if you hide, you're right. You're not going to be exposed. You're not going to be embarrassed. You're not going to feel worthless. All the things we're all afraid of, but it's a, it's a, it's a catch 22 because I remember when I was younger and I was like, I just, I'm not writing because it's too scary. And I'm afraid somebody will tell me I can't write. Mm -hmm. and my friend was like, so you don't write. And I was like, right, shoot, I'm doing it already. <laughs> like if the goal, if you're afraid that you can't show your work because somebody will tell you that you can't be a writer, that, but you're not being a writer, you're doing it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we all control, we all hide, everybody, we're human beings. I've seen at Pixar, we saw people who had won multiple Academy Awards still working through the places they were hiding. It's why they mm -hmm. do so many drafts. It's why they iterate so much because there's hiding consciously, like I am not going to give my work out. And then there's hiding unconsciously. Like you don't even know that some part of your brain is stuffing that down because mm -hmm. it's very worried about you bringing that up into the light. So there's multiple levels of hiding, totally. um, which is why art is evolving. Cause you have to, you have to bring it up into the light, which is why you have to get notes. But um, I would just say, at, you know, in terms of hiding, you're not alone. We're all afraid of it. It's not like there's this special species of humans um, who aren't afraid to put themselves and their work out there. I mean, there are sociopaths who are mentally different, but even they, I, but we'll, I won't get into that. But generally, most humans are afraid of this. They do it anyways. And that the more you do it, the less scary it is. It never fully becomes unscary. I'm not going to say that because it can't be, but the more it is a muscle that you can learn. You have to put yourself out there and find out you don't die, put yourself out there and you get bad feedback. You didn't die. But as a matter of fact, oh my gosh, it got better because as much as that feedback hurt, it showed you a blind spot in your craft in whatever, you know, I, I, I get it. Like I think about this art thing I want to make and I'm like, oh my God, I don't know if I'm going to show anybody because it might look like a two-year-old made it. But if I like it, oh, well, I might show it to you. And if you don't like it because it looks like a two-year-old made it, I might be like, I know, but it's kind of cool. I really <laughs> I like it. it. I made it. And so <laughs> it's just, it's just, again, going back to appreciating where you are and, and that the process of getting better is not hiding. That mm. is the process of getting better. There is no other way to do it. And I also think we can be working against ourselves. Like 
Um, in terms of hiding, I grew up in a house with five kids, total chaos. Of course, my parents were great, but it's, it's chaos. And I decided that the best way to survive this was to disappear. Mm -hmm. So the way you disappeared is I got straight A's. I read a lot and I just didn't put my head up. Right. Here's the problem. Now I want to be a writer. You have to appear. So that part of me that was a survival instinct of disappear fights me all the time because it thinks I'm going to die. Like, I think some part of me literally thinks it I does. Will die. It does. It really it's does. It's a survival instinct. So I res- so have to respect it. it. You'll like functionally to sell the- die. Yeah, because to say to people, don't hide. Okay, but it is a survival instinct. It is, and you have yeah. to respect. So I usually, long before I went to Pixar, this survival instinct of disappear, disappear would rise up in me. And I remember I was putting chains in a meter because I had to go into a meeting in which I was really going to have to appear. Like I was going to have to show up. Here's Meg. Here's what I love. Here's what I love. And I'm putting chains and this thing rose up. Who the hell do you think you are? Go home. Just say you're sick. Don't do it. Right. And it started to flash all the images of how, what a disaster this meeting was going to be. They were going to laugh. They're all, it's flashing images at me because it thinks I'm going to die if I walk in the door. And I literally imagined a little red chair in my head. And I was like, please go sit down. First of all, thank you. You are trying to keep me alive. Thank you. Respect. But I'm not going to die. So please go sit in that red chair and watch. I'm not going to die. And it has taken me lots of times of doing this for that part of me to believe I won't yes, die. Yeah. Cause you're giving it data. You're giving it experience. I'm giving, yeah. Because your brain only knows what it knows and what it's experienced. And it only experienced a kind of psychological death when I did appear. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it has to have new data. It has to exactly. see. And, and you have to reflect on it so that your brain can actually get it. And, and that you can literally burn a new pathway. Yes, like yes. You have to burn a new pathway. And here's the crazy part of it for me. I didn't not die. I lived bigger. Basically, you can't get better. You can't close that gap if you don't come out of hiding little by little. And what Meg described is, is what I call the emotional immune system. So it's, it's built into us to try to keep ourselves safe. It's never going to go away. But through these experiments, through these little steps, and then reflecting on them with help from other people, with our own journal, with a therapist, with a friend, with just the process of driving home from the meeting and being like, I did it and I didn't die. I did it and I didn't die. We have to have that self-reflection or the emotional immune system can't expand and give us more room to take more risks. Because our emotional immune system is like the, the Wizard of Oz. It's like the man behind the curtain saying, don't look at me. Don't look at me. Don't change. Don't actually realize you can do this. So it's got to be built into your creative process that you reflect, I didn't die. Even if it didn't go well, even if it hurts, even if you had to take a week off and watch a ton of TV and eat a ton of popcorn, you still didn't die. So how are you reflecting on that and who's helping you do that? What's the process for that? Gathering data, not to try to jolly yourself out of it and and be all toxic positivity, but to notice what actually happens and what did feel good and what didn't feel good and that you didn't die. So important. It's a a reverse. It's a reverse. So often what we were taught as children will keep us alive, a behavior that we're doing. We have to give it up as adults in order to live more fully. And it's really hard. It's really hard. And often this is what a character goes through just by the way, in a a movie, the more you put yourself out there and not hide, the more data your brain's going to get, it's going to get easier. And you're going to find out things about yourself. You're going to find out the blind spots are going to start going away. And you're going to be like, oh my gosh, I'm actually more comfortable hating myself than I am taking compliments or liking myself. Wow. It actually feels more comfortable to hate myself. Mm-hmm. This is, I got to look at that or whatever it is, right? Mm-hmm. So it is a lot, it is a process. It's not going to happen overnight, but you all you, listen, just start by noticing, oh, I'm hiding. Yeah. And, Don't do anything and about it. Don't do anything about exactly, it. Exactly. I'm that's hiding. Right. That's right. So that your brain goes, catches it. I, I'm hiding. Right. And then the more you catch, I'm hiding. Now take a little step out, 5% out. Don't, and it's just a process. Again, I guess maybe that's the theme today. It's just a process. It's steps. You're not going to just suddenly like not hide. I get it. Like who would ask you to do that? But you can take steps out. You can. And that's where, again, where the support group comes from, right? Mm-hmm. Because they're helping you not hide. 
You know, right. Lorian helps me not hide. I help Lorian not hide. And then you reflect back to each other. I and mean, this is so essential. You can't do it alone because your brain will sometimes not take that data in, right? No, I didn't. I didn't die. I actually lived bigger. I'm driving home from that meeting feeling good. And your brain's like, let's not pay any attention to that. Let's just go back to the story. Yeah, because I don't die. want to change the story that we <laughs> right, have going I don't want on. To but then, so that didn't happen. But right, then your buddy gets like, to say, yeah, 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 yeah that went well. <laughs> that actually And or well. if it didn't, you didn't die. You didn't die. It went bad and you still didn't die. And guess you what? You can go have another meeting. Yes. And they don't like it. So what? You know, like, and it's good to have those. I took a self-defense course once and they made us as one person was, you know, practicing and hitting the gut, the padded guy. We all had to stand around her and yell, you've got it. Go hit him, hit him here and give her the instructions. And they said that women who had unfortunately been attacked after this class, that chorus came back. Wow. In the moment of stress and trauma, that oh, chorus overtook, it overtook all the other instincts so that they could do what they needed to do to protect themselves. And that's why you need to find your chorus so that as you're starting to go down into the self-doubt or the hiding, I can hear Lorian going, you know, things did tend to work out for you. So let's, <laughs> let's, let's get up. Let's just keep going. You have been nominated for Academy Award. <laughs> things do tend to work out for you. <laughs> uh, this has been, I could talk to you two all day. You're both just amazing in so many ways. All right, last question I like to ask everybody, what will you learn next? Oh, really? Is that a requirement? No, you can totally <laughs> say. I'm going to learn to make I'm going to make this art piece. That's You're what gonna I'm going to make gonna, this art I don't piece. listen, I don't know, it's going to be slow. Ask me in 5 years if I've okay. made it, but I'm going to learn a new piece. I, I literally I'd sign up for next my next class. It starts on Sunday. Excellent. You're going to learn how to make your art piece and we can and leave it at and that. Be, yeah. be terrible at it. And that's kind of going to be the goal. That. Yeah. I love that too. I am going to learn how to um, make space so that my needs have equal value with everyone else in my house. Yes. I love that. That's awesome. Deep breath. <sighs> Deep breath. You said <laughs> you that on it. a podcast. <laughs> People are going yes. to know you set that not, goal. <laughs> not more just equal, right? Okay, so that we'll I am equal. not serving everyone else's needs before mine, because isn't that easier? Isn't that a way to hide? Mm, right? Sure. Oh, I had to help my daughter with school. Oh, I needed to do this. I need to be of service, which is so comfortable for me as a woman, what I've been taught, right? So <laughs> what the, cu yeah. the culture teaches you every day. Yes. So yeah, but that's above. valuable. And but it is a way to hide. It's a really yes. good uh, insight. It is a way to hide. That's beautiful. Well, again, thank you. Thank you. I feel so excited by this conversation. I learned a lot. You're both absolutely brilliant and delightful. So thanks for Hi. taking time. Thank with you. Korea thanks for having us here. Right? Were you as blown away as I was? Don't tell me if you weren't. <laughs> I just, I just keep thinking about what Meg said about, but I believe in this story, the passion in her voice and how Lorian, you know, keeps showing up even with the struggles with, you know, having to sell their house and comic book collection. And wow, that's a lot of dedication to the calling. And, and I love Meg's story of, of the worst day of being a writer is better than my best day of being a producer. Man, that's, that's telling, isn't it? Sit in our calling, own our calling. So many gems. All right. Hey, if you loved it as much as I do, can you pop on over to Apple Podcasts and give me a review. It really helps other people find the podcast. I know it's kind of a pain in the ass, but it's really, really useful. So if you got a moment, I'd appreciate it. And in the meantime, guess who we are going to have next week? Amazing Morgan Harper Nichols, poet, Instagram phenom, artist, musician, an incredible soul. You are going to walk into her life and we're going to talk once again about money and creating and managing a small child and oh, so much. I really loved her and I love, uh, I love what I learned. I just love being in her presence as I do like all these guests, right? All right. So hopefully I will see you back here next week. And in the meantime, if you can give me a review, fantastic. But what's most important? What's your takeaway? What, what are you going to use? What are you going to remember? Text it to a friend, write it in your journal, share it on social media. It'll make you remember it and take it to heart way more than if you just let this episode recede into the ether. All right. Most of all, I hope you'll be, what? Yep. Yeah, creating out loud. Thanks. See you soon.